everybody. Welcome to our final, but certainly not our least significant presentation. We have had five sesquicentennial lectures this year, and this is our fifth. Before we go ahead, I really want to thank our sponsors. Purple, Sorensen, Gallaudet Interpreting Service, Philip Grant, Grand Fund, and Access Captioning, and the Alumni Association of Gallaudet. I would like to briefly introduce Felicia Williams, who is then going to introduce our speaker, Richie Bryant, today. But before I do that, <laughs> my apologies. I want to so much thank the committee who has pulled together our lectures for this year. You've done a wonderful job. The members of the committee are Teresa, I'm sorry, I can't spell your name anymore, Teresa Platanos. Uh, Solomon also, thank all of you for your hard work. And also Mather, thank you also for selecting our absolutely wonderful speakers for this year. We're so excited. Okay, now, back to Felicia Williams. Uh, we've chosen her for a very special reason. She was the first recipient of the Nathy Marbury Award for a Master's in Sign Language Instruction in Education. So it was the Master's in ASL Education. Felicia, that was a huge honor, and that's why we have selected you to introduce our speaker today. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before I introduce our presenter, I do want to talk about myself. I am a faculty member in the Department of ASL Deaf Studies, and I graduated just last May, and as MJ mentioned, I was the first recipient for the Nathie Marbury Award. Now let me talk about our speaker, Richie Bryant. He's originally from Texas, in Dallas. However, he now resides in Austin. He attended public schools and then went to Gallaudet University and majored in sign communication, which is now the ASL Deaf Studies Department. He got his master's degree at McDaniel College, which used to be the Western Maryland College. Once he got his degree, he went on to teach in the ASL field as well as in interpreting. He then settled in Austin Community College, and that's where he met Nathie. He taught for 20 years, and he has also been a certified deaf interpreter since 2000. His work has been inspired by Nathie as a black deaf woman, as has my work. Let's all welcome our presenter today. However, before I do that, let me also say that he is a member of the Deaf Hood Foundation, and it's very important to recognize his work in that, and let's welcome him to the floor. Thank you so much, Felicia, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be back home at Gallaudet University. I haven't been on campus for about four or five years now. Um, Dr. Bienvenu asked me if I would be able to lecture here at Gallaudet University regarding Dr. Marbury, and my answer was a resounding yes, because I felt that it was time for us to introduce the world to Nathy, the w Nathy Marbury to the world. So I feel that it's appropriate time for us to explain why she's such a trailblazer and a pioneer for us. Let me talk about who Nathie Marbury is. And considering this presentation, I tried to find a sentence that would sum up her life and her work and what she means to us. And after much reflection, I decided on this sentence that's a reflection an embodiment of who she is. I 
everyone knows who Jackie Robinson is, um, the very well-known baseball player. Um, he was African-American. He was involved in the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team um, back in New York um, before it um, went to Los Angeles. And during that time, baseball was a white sport. Um, there were no people of color who were allowed to be um, in the sport until Jackie Robinson, who was the first. He was the one that made that groundbreaking move into the Major League Baseball area. And this was during the, during the 1950s that this occurred. Um, people had a very negative stereotype of African Americans and Jackie Robinson came into a predominantly white um, sport and all eyes were on him. Therefore, he bore the responsibility and the weight of his entire race. Um, if he did not do well and if he was not successful, then that stereotype would be applied to every black man who wanted to enter the sport. Um, he was able to proceed with dignity and with fine character. And he actually was able to accomplish that. And the result of that is that more people of color were able to um, get into the Major League Baseball arena. So let's think now how this connects to Dr. Marbury, to our beloved Nathy. Here are some of her firsts. She was the first African-American woman to be involved as an ASL model for a major publisher. She was the first black deaf teacher at the Kendall Demonstration School. She was the first black deaf ASL specialist at that school as well. Therefore, she also um, broke that proverbial glass seating and was able to make those pioneering moves into arenas where people of color were not normally accepted. And so she is so important to us. All of her accomplishments are really relevant to us today. So looking at all of these accomplishments, we start to reflect. Her, her impact wasn't just because of her accomplishments or her work, it was because of her presence the powerful presence that she had. Her personality was infectious. She was a hard worker. And I'll talk more about her wonderful work ethic and her personality during this presentation. Many people feel that Nancy's first uh, ASL documentation on film was done just recently, but actually was done recently in the Green Books, but it was actually way before that that she was actually on film. And let's take a look at that. Zoom was a series that was shown on television. Um, it was reflecting or portraying the lives of persons in the local area. Um, it was on public television, much like the public broadcasting system. Um, so they were filming the lives of different people within that area or within that city. And so that series was known as Zoom. I recently found this information two weeks ago. Um, Nathy had it hidden away um, because she didn't feel that this um, film was uh, a good representation. And after seeing the film, I understand the reasons for her keeping it, um, you know, in a hidden vault, so to speak. But I do feel that this has historical significance for several reasons, which I will explain. I would like you to take a look at this brief clip. And afterwards, I'll give you my observation. It's not the entire documentary. It's only a few minutes clip of her going to the supermarket with her two kids. So we'll take a look. Lock the door. Work. 
What kind of vegetables are you getting? Having succotash, corn. I learned sign language before I learned to speak. How I learned to talk was probably around some of my friends and also from school. No. And wait. That's 28 cents. Chicken neck. I've got some responsibilities that some other kids don't have. When I'm out with my parents, sometimes the hearing people can't understand what my mother or my father is saying, so I have to interpret for them. Um, I'd like to give you the backstory on this the reproduction of this film. Uh, Nathy actually wasn't approving of the way that the film took place because obviously she's a very strong black deaf woman who has a can-do attitude. However, the filmmaker's focus was on the children helping their deaf mother, um, who was in a world where she could not communicate and therefore her children were that channel. And this is in conflict with um, Nathy's own convictions. And notice here that Nathy is usi utilizing her voice to speak, and she usually does not use spoken English. Um, however, the filmmaker made her do that, made her speak. The second point is that um, when she was communicating with the um, woman, with the man, uh, actually with the butcher, about the chicken and wanted it to be cut up, um, usually Nathy, what Nathy would do is that she would gesture um, to the person and try to get her, com her message across. But in the film, we see that she allowed the daughter to interpret for her. And this is not naturally what she would do. So it's re really a misrepresentation of who she is. However, as I mentioned, it does have s historical significance. And for one main reason, when I first saw the, this film, um, I thought to myself that I had a dislike for it. I didn't like the filmmaker's focus. So it has a strong historical significance, and I wanted to be able to represent that. I felt that that was very important, even though um, it had all of those um, negative parts of it. And I could see it through a different lens for that reason. Um, through, that lens, through that lens, I could see, for instance, that it's the first documentary film about the life of a coda. Okay, so not just a life of a coda, but a life of a black coda. And this is something that we don't have uh, documented, and to have this um, back in the 1970s is amazing. Uh, so that has a lot of worth for us. And I'm pretty sure that black deaf codas would love to have some type of information about their own history, and to have this from the decade of the 70s is fantastic. It's really great to have this information at hand. I was talking to a colleague of mine, Lisa Gillenu. Um, she's actually an instructor at the interpreting program at Austin Community College. And we, you know, been working together. Um, and we looked at this series Zoom and we had a great discussion and did a cultural analysis of the film and really tried to look not just at it on its face value, but try to look at the back the backstory and the background that came along with it. And we really saw that as a starting point of Natty's work. So it was truly representing where she began and her progression. I did extensive research and it was able to find many contributions that Dr. Marbury made to scholarship. There's a wealth of experience and service that she has provided to the community. And we do not do her justice. We don't talk, to talk about her enough. Um, we have only superficially been able to really examine her work. We haven't been able to delve into it. 
And so I was able to look through many different sources and be able to um, glean this information that I have here. And I want to do more than just a superficial um, search of that. I want to really delve into it and talk about who Dr. Marbury is and what contribution she has made to the ASL and Deaf Studies field. Um, and another note is that I myself teach ASL or American Sign Language at the Austin Community College and many times I'm utilized as a sign model and usually um, it's a one-time deal it's not something that I do repeatedly um, if I'm asked to do so it's it's quite rare There are some sign models that are used on a regular basis in different publications. One is very well known, for instance, Ella May Lentz. Um, you see her quite frequently in different publications, video and um, in paper. Um, Patrick Graybill is another one. And of course, we know our well known and beloved um, MJ Bienvenu is also a, a frequently used sign model. So there's quite a, a small elite group of people who are documented and filmed continuously in, the, in our field. Um, so it's rare to see um, someone of color be able to um, work in different arenas and work with different publishing companies. So to see this is very impressive. Uh, we all know the famous Green Book publications. Um, that's where um, Nati was really able to show her work. After examining this, I was um, so impressed and amazed. I found it to be awe-inspiring. This video in itself is very unique. Uh, so this film actually is from the Green Book publication, and I'd like to show it to you now. Two weeks ago, I was with my daughter, who is 10. I have another daughter who is 14, and my husband, we were out eating. As we were eating, my husband told me to take a look at my daughter. I asked her, what is it that you have in your shirt? What's going on? And she said, I have nothing in my shirt. There's nothing there. And I asked her again, and she denied and said that there was nothing inside of her blouse. And then she rapidly ate her food and took off and went to the bathroom. And my husband and I, you know, looked at each other. My husband told me to take care of it, but he said, you know, be nice. I said, okay. So I went over, you know, followed her into the bathroom, her, un her not knowing that I was following her. So I, I bust open the door, and she covered herself, and she said, Mom, why are you, you know, invading my privacy? And so I asked her, what's going on? What is it that you have there? And she took out something and shook it in her hand, and it was a bra. And I was thinking to myself, why do you need to use a bra? You're flat-chested. And she said, I wanted to try it out to see how it felt. A friend of mine gave it to me to, to test it out and to see whether or not I liked it and if I wanted to use it. And I told her, you don't need to use a bra because it's not necessary. You're flat-chested. And she said, no, I'm not. And so I said, well, let me take a look. I told her, honestly, there's nothing there. If you had needed a bra, I would have gone to the store and gotten one for you. Where did you get that from? And she answered again that a friend gave it to her. And I could not believe that, and so I told her, let me take a look at it. And when I examined the bra, I noticed that it belonged to her sister, and I told her that. And she said, no, that a friend of hers gave it to her to try it out. And I said, are you sure? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up your sister and ask her and see if it's hers or not. And she said, no, don't do that. And she said, well, yes, it, it, it is my sister's. Oh, are you sure it's your sister's or your friend's? Because I think it's your sister's. It belongs to your sister, right? So she was still kind of denying it. And I said, well, I'm going to go ask her. And then finally, she copped she cop to the truth and said, yes, I, I, I lied. It does belong to my sister. And she started pouting. And I just looked at her and nodded my head. 
and we went back to the table to join the family. I'd like to talk about what makes this video so unique. These characteristics that um, Nati shows are black cultural characteristics that she was able to retain. And this is some not something that you see um, in ASL publications. That's one reason why this is so notable. I actually contacted Ella and asked her what it was like at that time, who were filming and who were involved in the production, and who was the ASL coach. And I asked whether or not there was one. And Ella mentioned that they had scripts and translations that they did, but there was no ASL coach to speak of. And I actually thought that was a good thing, because if there was an ASL coach, I know for sure that probably they would have modified that and made her get rid of some of those black cultural characteristics and perhaps fit a model that would be more appropriate or considered to be more appropriate. But all of those um, non-manual markers and those characteristics were important to have those retained. And over time, those change after the years of her being filmed and so on. Um, we notice that those are not shown as much. This is uh, Lisa, the colleague I spoke of earlier, and she works at the Austin Community College along with myself. And uh, she worked very closely with Nathy for many years, and they became very good friends. And in fact, they worked and knew each other longer than I knew Nathy. And she's going to tell a story about one particular experience she had uh, regarding Nathy. It's a very powerful story. So we were in the office, um, me and Nathy, and I let her know that I was there, and then I went into another room, and I was chatting with somebody, and then this woman ran into the room and said, do you realize Nathy is here? I didn't quite understand what all the commotion was about, but I realized that she was starstruck, and she was ready to worship at the feet of Nathy. What she told me was is that when she studied sign language, she watched a lot of videotapes and they were helpful. But once she saw Nathy, a black deaf woman like herself, she was more motivated to learn the language than ever. This really tells us how many lives Nathy touched, how much impact she had on the black deaf community. So you see how critical this is. We're talking about a role model in our community. I know a lot of people don't realize the importance of having black deaf role models. It's really about combating the negative perceptions that are alive in our society about people of color. We have a desire for positive role models. We need to see our faces reflected. So this is the story of this woman who was studying sign language, who had seen faces that didn't look like hers over and over again. And then once she saw Nathy's face, she was inspired to continue her studies. That was Nathy as a role model at her best. We all know that diversity is important, and that's unquestionable. I remember when I came here as a Gallaudet student in my very first year, I had some role models. They were black professionals, which I had never seen in my life before. 
in fact, because of that, I thought that perhaps the kind of work that I would end up having would be manual labor. And it wasn't until I came to Gallaudet and I was forced to think bigger, and I did. Again, this is the importance of role models and how role models changed my life. And you may think it's just one little event or one little person, but those singular events or singular people can change the path of people's lives just by their presence. We know that our country is changing and we know that we are becoming a more diverse community and we know that uh, people of color will no longer be a minority in 10 or 20, 30 years. We also have been uh, bombarded with negative images and that is changing and we are beginning to truly appreciate the gifts that diversity bring us. Often, black, deaf individuals don't see a bright future for themselves until they see a role model, until they see what is possible. Once they do, they are inspired to work harder and go further. ASL doesn't just belong to one group of people. It belongs to everybody. It belongs to everybody of different colors and races and nationalities. Nathy experienced a transformation. And it was at the time where she was living in Oakland, California. She was teaching ASL to a number of students. And there was one gentleman in the class named Quinu Brooks. And as I said, he was Nathy's student. And he was a diligent student, and he was very engaged, and asked a number of questions of Nathy. Uh, he asked about the black deaf community. And Nathy found herself with a lack of answers. And it seemed that Nathy didn't really have a full understanding of black culture. So Quinu took it upon himself to make sure Nathy understood that. And she did. And her life changed from that experience. She learned about black culture. She learned about herself. She realized that she had grown up with a very strong association and deaf identity. But the person of color part of her was not really emphasized. In her encounters with Keanu, that changed. She knew that she was a black deaf woman. She, she then engaged in poetry, in arts, and all of that reflected the change and transformation in her identity. You know, it, before it was, things were so bad when they talked about black deaf families and they talked about tradition and they talked about how all of these uh, stories are passed on. In, for black deaf people, they would engage in all these rituals in the black culture, but they didn't understand why, because the stories behind them were never told. So in flipping these words, we really reflect what the transformation for Nathy was all about. I'm going to show you two clips. They're the same story told twice. The first story happened before her transformation, and the second story happened afterwards. Please take note of some of the differences in the sharing of these stories. I remember when I was a child, around the age of six, I was in a school with mostly white kids, 
I was maybe one of six black kids in school. And one of the little girls came up to me and said, you're dirty. Um, you don't bathe. And I said, no, I do. I bathe every day. And she said, no, you're dirty. I'm going to wash you. And she dragged me um, by the arm and took me to the bathroom. And everyone knows what Ajax is, right, that cleaner. Um, she got some wet towels, wet it with some water, threw some Ajax soap on it, and proceeded to scrub my arm um, while I was wincing from the pain. And she just kept scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing. And after she rinsed it off with some water, she said, it won't wash off. You're not dirty. OK, we can be friends now. And she took me by the arm, and we walked away. When I entered the deaf school, my first deaf friend was Linda Lou Smith. Her married name is now Mahoka. She's living in Pittsburgh. I saw her last summer. She was that girl with the red ball. I'd gone off to play with her. Time passed. I remember being one of only six black students at the school. Many of the white students had never seen a black person before. One of them came up to me. The girl's leader let the rest of her friends surround me. They threw insults at me. You're dirty. You've never taken a bath. I said, I was born with this skin. It's God's gift. No, you've never bathed. Dirty. They kept insulting me. I just nodded my head and said, this is my skin. You're white and I'm brown. We're different. But they pushed me into the restroom. I struggled, of course, but with five to one, it was not worth fighting. In the restroom, they pulled out paper towels and wet them under the faucet. Then they shook a huge can of Ajax, industrial strength for the school, on top of the wetted towels. Then they started rubbing it on my arm. I felt incredible singes of pain. I screamed, which was worthless. Our supervisor was also deaf. After wiping the Ajax off my arm with water, they looked at my arm and then at me. The brownness of my skin didn't come off. See, I said, I was born that way. My arm was still red, still feeling burning pain. They kept looking at me, wondering. They went, oh. After that, we became great friends. They understood that skin colors are different. They were young and innocent children who didn't know any better. Do I blame them? No, I blame their parents for not explaining. I was their first exposure to a black kid and the notion of race. Here on my arm are some scars from that Ajax, still there. I will never forget, I told that story to a girl last summer. She doesn't remember that, doesn't remember that. We know that uh, later in her life, Nathy thought about accountability a lot more. And she knew it was important to hold people accountable and name names. She didn't do that in the first clip. The other difference that you'll notice here is the how she describes the experience in graphic detail. And, and you can see that she's really attempting to put you in her shoes. Thirdly, how she addresses the conclusion of the experience, she points out the scars on her arm and the fact that they are still there. But she doesn't mention that in the first clip. These are all indications of her transformation. We know, uh, you know, a good example of this is when you think about slavery, okay? I grew up learning about slavery and I knew it was a bad thing. And it was told pretty much from the, the white people's perspective. But how bad, I didn't really understand that 
until I was able to really put myself in their shoes and understand what their daily lived experiences were like. That's the same thing that's happening here with Nathie. She experienced that oppressive I experience and through her life, she's still working with it and figuring out how to break through that and transform, which she has done and we can see that through these two clips. We can all recognize this as the continent of Africa. Uh, we have a number of different signs that we've been using for this. One is the A that goes around the face and the other one is the more classifier type that uh, outlines the shape of the continent. And then, of course, we can spell it. Now, the uh, sign that outlines the shape of the continent was actually uh, created by Nathy. And the reason why she did that is because she objected to the sign that had been using we had been using previously, which was the A that traced the face and, an and ended on the, no on the nose all of these reflecting color and historically had a negative association. So she wanted to create a new sign free from that negative association. And so she created the sign Africa, and it took on. And most people in the ASL communities took on that sign for Africa. Many years later, she realized that she had made a mistake. And the reason for that is because the way people were producing the sign, it started to uh, become, started to look like a reference to female genitalia. And it, it was then negative in another way. So we went back to using the A that traces the face, but we dropped the part that ends up on the nose. So again, this is an interesting story, and you see the impact that she has had. Uh, she may deny this. <laughs> but it will always be a story, a legend, an urban legend, if, if you will. So let's talk about her doctoral dissertation dissertation. She uh, got her doctoral degree from Lamar University. She was over 60 when she got her degree. 63 to be precise. So she talked about the triple whammy of being black, deaf, and female. She also addressed the missing link, black culture. We know that being black can be seen as negative. We know that being deaf can be seen and experiences being negative. And we know that women also can be experienced that way. And if you have all three as part of your life experience, those are three challenges. It's what she called the triple whammy. In my experience with black deaf women, they are hard workers, they value family, and black women in general are, are the kind of people who are the glue that really holds the family together. This is what we often experience. As opposed to black men, Black men, we know, uh, are seen very negatively also. So I have a different type of triple whammy. I'm black, deaf, and I'm a male. So this is what the dissertation covered. It was about that experience of being black, deaf, and a woman. She also covered the missing link, black culture. If you recall earlier, I was talking about how deaf children in, uh, in families would participate in black culture, and they would be very engaged, but they might not really understand why 
or the backstory. Again, they would participate, they would eat the food, they would go to church, they would have the reunions, but they didn't know why they were eating this particular food. Uh, they would go to church, but they wouldn't understand how important the church was to the black community. So that piece of culture was absent for them because they did not have access, because they did not share the language that they did with their families. Now, when they went to schools and proper education was being provided, the cultural piece was absent. Also, I forgot to add, um, she covered the impact of lack of role models in the black deaf community. And I spoke about this earlier, how important it is. I don't think that we realize how absolutely critical role models are to all of us. One person uh, that stands out for me is Laureen Sims. She talks about a teacher of hers. And she talks about how she decided to become a teacher. She was at the Indiana school, and they had uh, the you know big sister, big brother program. And uh, she had this one person that she was hanging out with, and she realized later that she was very grateful to her, even though you know it wasn't a formal relationship. She was just there for her. She was inspirational to her and had an impact. And again, we talk about the presence. So this teacher had a presence for Laureen that inspired her. I'm gonna show you a clip of Dr. Jan Humphrey. She wrote a book on interpreting. It's called, So You Wanna Be an Interpreter? She co-authored it with um, Bob Al Alcorn, who has passed since. Uh, Jan was very close with Nathy. She worked with her uh, collaboratively on a number of different projects. And she's going to talk about her experience with Nathy. Nathie and I were very, very close, and I am so going to miss her. I do already miss her. Nathie changed my life. She changed my thinking. And uh, one of the ways she did that is to teach me about minorities. You know, I'm white. Um, I did not experience a whole lot of oppression in my life. I remember one time in particular, uh, she was moving and I was helping her move. We were packing up boxes, you know, it was a new town for her and everything. And we were chatting. And she had told me that one of the reasons she was leaving the area is because she felt like she didn't feel like there was enough black people. She felt like the community was too small for her and she didn't have enough support. And I listened and acknowledged that. And at lunchtime, I went out to get some you know, McDonald's fast food or something like that. And I came back and I said, Nathie, Nathie, I saw two black people at McDonald's. And Nathie looked at me and she smiled. And that afternoon, I went out to get some more boxes for packing. And I came back and I said, Nathie, Nathie, I saw three more black people. And Nathie again benevolently smiles at me. The next day, I went out and came back and I said, Nathy, guess what? I saw some more black people. And Nathy stopped me and she said, Jan, if you can count the number of black people in this city on your hands, there's not enough. That really helped me understand her experience. Here I was all excited about counting black people. But if you can count how many minorities are around, there are not enough. Thank you so much, Nathy, for that very important lesson.
And this leads to my next point. I had an office right next to Nathie's, and we would talk about all kinds of stuff. We would talk about how to produce more materials with black faces and role models, and we, all, we thought very much alike. It was dynamic. It's common for black teachers in general in colleges uh, usually to have just one. You know, you're going to have one in a program, one at a university, and here we had found each other in the same program at the same university, and we took advantage of that. We supported each other. We were there for each other. We had the same dreams. We had the same visions. We saw things the same way. Historically, it was always me carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders and my people to fight. This time I had her beside me. It was wonderful to have more people of color in the same department and in the program. The point of all of this and the point behind Jan's story is this. Do we have enough? I did a very comprehensive survey, and I have to tell you what I found was abysmal. Clearly, it's not enough. We need more. We can count this on our two hands. It's not enough. Of interest, I uh, had to decide which one of these I was going to show and I wanted to represent, you know, the rainbow of our diversity, and I was unable to find any deaf Asian faces. So I got in the VP with a good friend of mine. Her name is Shari Kiddo, and she, majors in ASL, she majored in ASL studies at the same time I did, and she happens to be half Japanese. So I was calling her, and I wanted to ask her if she knew of any Asian deaf faces in ASL Lit. She had a negative response for me that was quite elucidating. Clearly, we don't have enough. Clearly, we need more. There's a, here is a, a woman's filmmaker, Jade Bryan. She actually produced a number of pieces Her current project is working on black deaf families. She has had a lot of struggles in getting her project funded. But again, this goes to the concept. Black deaf families, it's giving us a whole nother facet on the community, uh, uh, on looking at the black deaf community. Looking at black deaf families, look at Mexican deaf families, look at Asian deaf families, all of this information is important for us. We want to know what they share and how they're different. We want to know, I want to know that, I imagine that you all want to know that too. So Nathie created quite a body of work. There was one project in particular that I worked on with her and two other individuals developing a curriculum. And it's called True Work ASL. And this was a curriculum that was developed for our community college that we were also intending to share with other community college programs. We worked on this project uh, with the goal of having it online, 100% available online. We did that because we saw what the current trends are. Uh, we see that um, the there's a lot of energy going into digital textbooks. So we wanted to follow that trend. We wanted to ride that wave and make sure that our information was available online or to have apps available. So we were definitely looking way into the future. And pretty much we can see that all of, 
all of Deaf Studies work will be digitized. So we worked on this project. As I said, Nafi was involved. At the time is when she first began to get sick with cancer. And we did witness her experience pain and suffering through that. Uh, actually, before that, apparently she was sick and she had cancer and didn't know what was going on. And I remember really encouraging her to go to the doctor. And she was like, no, I want to work. I don't really have to. I said, listen, what's, what's the use if you don't go to the doctor and take care of yourself? You come here. We don't have your work. And eventually she did go to the doctor and she did find out that she had cancer. And things were never the same. Our work on the curriculum slowed. In fact, we were unable to finish uh, the work before she passed. We are still working on it. But I did want to share with you Nathie's last work. And, and, and think about her first work and compare that to this. My name is Lois, and I have two brothers. One brother is Johnny. He's 38 and married with three kids. My second brother is Jack. He's 35, and he has a partner, and they've been together for three years. And third is me. I'm the baby of the family and I'm going away to college. I'm going to major in English. And in the fall of 2013, my goal is to graduate. And you see her grace in the end. You see her enormous experience coming through even here. My presentation is over, and I want to thank you all so much for inviting me here. I want to give special thanks to Gallaudet University for the invitation. I have very much enjoyed talking with you all. I want to thank you, Dr. Bienvenu and Brian Griswold. Thank you as well. And the lecture series committee for inviting me as well. And I want to thank my colleagues at Austin Community College who absolutely assisted in this presentation today with giving me a wealth of feedback and information and data and materials to share with you today. And last uh, but not least, I'd like to thank our three interpreters. And I want to thank our third interpreter, who's a CDI on the team, and her name is Rainy Plaster. It's wonderful that they have a CDI on the team. I really support that. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming here today. I am the chair and the officer for diversity for the student body government. Enjoyed this presentation showing the body of work of Nathie, Nathie Marbury over the years and her work towards ASL studies um, curriculum development. Now it's time for us to have a question and answer session. Um, you will have an opportunity to come here to the right of the stage if you have any questions for um, Richie uh, Bryant right to the so Texas School for the Deaf. And I think I have a pretty good question for you about the Austin Community College and the community that's out there. I actually have a friend of mine who was an ASL teacher in Waco, Texas. Um, yes, I was mentioning they're an ASL instructor in Waco, Texas, and they have since passed away. And so they've tried to work in the um, in a local area, but we've noticed that um, in Austin they have to travel um, quite a quite a bit, um, about a 90-mile commute, in order to get in contact with the community. This one particular person is known as a deaf celebrity, uh, is known as a deaf sinner. And what happened is that they um, banned sign language completely. So there was this situation that was happening in Texas. And just one moment, we're trying to get clarification on the message. So 
So what happened is that they had this um, commute. Um, they were taking classes in Austin and bringing the signs that they were learning to Waco. And so d they, they were called deaf sinners, so to speak, because they were bringing the language. So I wanted to know whether or not you could expand on that practice on the influence of sign language from Austin to Waco. This is news to me. I'd never heard the term deaf sinner before. But what I will tell you is that um, Nathy came to our area about 13, 14 years ago. And when she was hired, um, right away uh, she had some credibility. And that attracted a number of people to our program. Uh, there was one person from another area who did take classes with Nath Nathy. And I can say that Nathy gave, uh, really she put our college on the map essentially. And thank you. Any other questions? All right, we have someone else. Please come on up. Hopefully everyone can see me okay. Um, you were mentioning about um, Nathy origini originating the sign for Africa. I'm sure that Africa is a very diverse country. Um, you have Egypt, you have Morocco. Not everyone is black necessarily. They all have different ethnicities. Um, so there's so many countries within Africa. Um, so I just wondered why this one sign is utilized to represent this entire continent and why that decision was made. Each, um, each country on the African continent has their own local languages. Uh, well, in England also, they will have their, they have the sign for their country. Now, in ASL, we used to sign Africa tracing our face and ending on the, the nose. Uh, now, I don't know what people actually, and also on the continent, they signed it the same way. And, uh, correct me if I'm wrong if there's other people who know other signs, but they did sign it with the A tracing the face. But Nathy's objection was the reference to color and the negative reference to color. And you know, she made a mistake. It was unintentional, and then she changed it back later. Hello. It was such an interesting presentation. Um, there was one part that touched me in particular. Um, you, you mentioned about the lack of Asian deaf representation in publications. I noticed that as, as well. So I really enjoyed you um, emphasizing that. And it's important to see minority sign models. And you were mentioning before about Nathy's um, change in her language from the 70s to today. And there's been quite a change. Um, so does that mean that in the past there was some type of um, exchange that was limited? Um, for instance, in the characteristics that she was showing in manual markers and in her body language, perhaps there was, there was those conflicts because there wasn't enough of an interaction between different groups? Remember it was in the 1960s that ASL was first uh, declared and recognized as a full language. So I think it's taken some time to really understand its complexities and its sophistication. So we're still learning about it. Then uh, schools were not teaching formal ASL until much later, uh, until the 80s or 90s even. And it wasn't until then that we saw formal classes being taught in ASL in very much the same way English is being taught in the schools. But that wasn't in place before the 80s or 90s. Around that time, also, uh, the idea of an ASL coach uh, developed. And before that time, there weren't really people in place to give that kind of feedback. Thank you. Hello. Last semester I studied ASL and one of my instructors mentioned about um, black American sign language in comparison to white American sign language. I've been watching different films and learning about that. I was wondering whether or not that black ASL research connects to your presentation 
And if you could please elaborate on your own experience regarding this. Now, remember, I grew up in Dallas, and I had a uh, black deaf family, third generation. Um, now, remember, the schools were segregated. And uh, because of that, yes, they had their own languages, their own cultures, and their own variations. Now, I didn't go to uh, the residential schools. I went to public schools. I did have a few friends with deaf parents who went to also public schools with me, but they had deaf parents, like I said, so I would go to their house. They would come to mine. We would get together. We would hang out. But I didn't really understand them, and I didn't realize it was because they were using black ASL. They would play, they would play cards, and they used this sign, and I had no idea. It looked like T to me, but they were referring to a particular kind of card game. So yes, there is definitely black ASL. I was not very familiar with it. So that means that obviously black ASL is going to be valued. You didn't change your sign language for the presentation, correct? Uh, because I think it's great for the black culture and black characteristics of ASL to be represented. I think it's important that we ca capture the variation on videotape. The population that is using that type of variation is getting smaller and smaller. In Texas, um, there's a BDO, which is a black, deaf, oh no, wait, it's B blind, deaf, uh, orphans, BDO. It's a Texas organization. They get together every year, every two years, and it's a essentially an alumni gathering for everybody who had been to their schools. When they gather, they are very diligent, diligent about capturing their stories on uh, videotape, so I suggest that we do the same thing. It's a real gem. I believe we do have some more time if there, if there are no more questions. Um, so before we officially close, I would like to emphasize that Dr. Nathan Marbury's work, um, compilations of that um, that are in Austin Community College are actually going to be brought here to our university's archives for your perusal. Um, so that body of work will be left um, for you. And during the week, you can take a look at that. So at this point, we would like to invite Felicia to the stage to give a token of our appreciation to Richie Bryant for coming here. All right, let's give him a great hand. Your, your presentation was absolutely outstanding. Nathie's legacy is so important. She's impacted our field, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that grows even more. Thank you for your time and sharing this very important information with our community and out those who are outside of our community. This gift is particularly powerful. This is a film of Nathie before she passed, and it's called Dream the Impossible Dream. This is also available on YouTube, and again, it's called Dream the Impossible Dream. It was one of her last productions to reach for the stars. And so we are giving you a star because Nathie was that in our field, and so are you. So you can open it now or open it later. That's up to you. <laughs> I'm afraid to drop it. Uh, it seems like I'm not too good at opening this. Maybe I could have a woman. You, are, you have more delicate fingers than I do. Very nice. So you can see that it's a star. And all of our dreams are alive. And we should all continue to reach for those stars and do not give up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you so much for everyone for attending. Um, the event is not over. We actually have some refreshments that are available outside. So everyone, have a great afternoon. <laughs>